Well, my name is uh, Craig Labovitz. I'm with Deepfield Networks. And today I'll be speaking about some of the measurements we've been doing, or I've been doing over the last several years, really trying to understand literally how the internet topology, the cloud topology is changing in response to the changing business drivers. And I'll talk more about what I mean in the next couple of slides. So this is my uh, one slide. It's kind of a non-slide about uh, my, my company. It's still a quiet mode company. We're launching uh, this summer, now in trials. And the team uh, came from a security background, a big internet measurement background with uh, Arbor Networks, NSFNet, and other places before that. So the actual talk today is based on five or now six years of ongoing research working with the internet providers, both consumer, uh, tier one, tier two, tier three, uh, the CDNs, understanding, getting telemetry from the core of the POPs of the internet, looking at routing data, looking at net flow traffic data, understanding literally how the topology is changing. And it's really been a remarkable transition over just the last five years. The internet is evolving in ways that look nothing like the fundamental architecture, how the networks interconnect, where the POPs are located, how the traffic is distributed across a backbone is completely different and changing rapidly. In the study today, at least in the next uh, five or 10 slides, I'll provide uh, some fairly detailed views uh, of this data set. The data set really is three different data sets. Uh, one is from the Atlas project, uh, where we had 110, uh, by the end, 120 providers contributing anonymous backbone telemetry, really at the company level, at the fairly high uh, you know, internet routing level of traffic, as well as routing topology. More recently, we've partnered with several consumer networks uh, in North America primarily, though now Europe as well, where we're getting anonymized data set again with a view of some subscriber level behavior, uh, particularly with respect to cloud services over the top services. And then uh, finally, we've got some commercial activities which uh, play at least a moderate role in the next couple of slides as well. So overall, a fairly large data set and one of the largest data sets uh, I, I think of its kind. But this is actually an old slide, one I gave in a talk several years ago, but for you know 150 years of telephony, of telegraph, uh, the architecture of the network basically looked the same. Very hierarchical, you had regional networks, small little regional networks, uh, you had them feeding up into larger uh, PTTs, the national networks. And the way traffic flowed through the network, the way interconnections worked, the way that money worked was all very similar. It all flowed, you know, one direction and traffic went, went down the other. But things over the last five years really began to change quickly. And I'll show some of the numbers that belie this slide coming up. But the old hierarchical internet is gone. Today we're increasingly moving to a very flat, dense, highly interconnected network where in fact most of the traffic isn't flowing up a long tree to reach the tier ones and back down. Most of the traffic today is interchanged between what we've been calling the hypergiants. Basically 150 companies now generate the vast majority of internet traffic. If you look at internet routing tables, if you look at internet maps, there's tens of thousands, 70,000 different entities out there. But 150 now contribute 60 to 70% of all traffic. So really dense interconnection now, and that includes the content, the hosting, and the CDN. This is just another way to look at that uh, progression. That back in 2007, the internet was a fairly diverse place. If you went to a website, it would be, you know, might actually be located in an enterprise data center, might be located somewhere on the internet. But over the last uh, three years of uh, in the graph here, and certainly accelerating into 2012, all of the content is moving out of the edges of the network, and increasingly, for the measurements we're taking, is now, again, basically in 150 CDNs, large hosting, large content, large cloud. For the average user, this basically is the internet. It's not the thousands of sites that they used to interconnect with. And one of the things that's really happening as well is, as I said, the internet used to be a fairly hierarchical. Today, you now have folks like Google and Facebook, all of the CDNs, basically directly interconnected, not only with the large tier one transit networks, 
But they're in interconnected basically with every network of any size as long as it makes basic economic sense. So the graph you're looking at here is between 2008 and 2011, uh, looking at actually Google. The amount of traffic Google had that was going over transit, primarily was level three and other people in the past, to the amount of traffic that Google shifted to direct interconnection with the consumer networks, the university networks, basically all the networks around the world. And this, by the way, doesn't even include the uh, Google Global caching, which is you know, pushing traffic even further to the edges. But the real growth driver, I think, over the last uh, certainly five years has been CDN. Based on our measurements back in 2010, we estimate that CDNs were about 20 to 30 percent of all internet backbone traffic on, on average for, uh, given providers. By 2012, this number has jumped consider considerably. It's now upwards of 45 percent. And in some networks, especially smaller networks that don't have enterprise and, and, and other sorts of services that they're offering, CDN traffic, whether it be on net caching, or to through peering and transit arrangements is up over 60%. And of course, as you've heard throughout uh, other presentations, there's one thing that's driving this. And that one thing, of course, is video, primarily now HD video. This is just taking a look at some of our measurements, looking at traffic volume. Uh, not the number of customers, though we have that data as well, but really looking at, in terms of average backbone CDN uh, traffic volumes, uh, how do the CDNs, uh, what's the distribution of sort of traffic volume share? I think not surprisingly, Akamai continues to be the largest CDN by traffic volume. Uh, but we're also seeing amongst the next two, the big, you know, in the big three, uh, we're seeing significant growth in, in the market sort of shift with, with Limelight uh, level three, uh, especially, you know, a lot of it due to Netflix, of course, gaining share as well. Uh, Amazon Edgecast take the third and fourth, and then all the other CDNs in terms of traffic volume uh, have that last slice. And again, I caution, this is traffic volume. It's not about profitability. It's not about performance. It's not related to any economic measure. It's just looking at backbone, average backbone traffic volumes going to the different CDNs. Just one metric of size, at least of capacity. And as I mentioned, some of the broad trends are that the CDNs now are almost completely peered. Over the last five years, the big game was for the CDNs to interconnect with all the smaller networks. It made a huge difference for all of those networks to uh, offload the transit costs. The challenge now is they're done. The networks are completely peered. Now what do you do to offload that bandwidth? So you're seeing a lot of interest now from the carriers we're working with about not just the Tier 1, the NFL, or NHL cities, looking at interconnection in secondary markets. And you're seeing, of course, lots of new entrants. Uh, as I think in the earlier panel, they're talking about now the dozens of different companies all trying to offer uh, subscriber networks, caches to go in their networks. And you're also seeing, I think, a change in the equation. It's not just the topology that's changing, but I think the economics are changing as well, in that you're seeing a lot more interest now in eyeball networks, consumer networks, tier ones, and the discussions are having. It's not just place everything in our network, thank you very much, you know, we'll give you free cooling, power, racks. It's about understanding what are the equitable arrangements. That includes things like bit mile calculations, economic value of content, and other ways of understanding the relative trade-offs uh, between eyeballs and the content. And of course, FTTH and HD are really changing the landscape as well. Uh, just to quickly, uh, I think, conclude the talk, I'll talk a little bit about how the traffic is changing as well. This is a graph looking at traffic between 2008 and 2010. And, of course, one of the big things happening over time is all traffic over time becomes the web. All other specialized video protocols have gone out the door. Uh, Xbox used to have own, its own gaming. Everything is now using the web as a protocol. And you're seeing... Uh, a lot of this traffic isn't broken out, but of course, a lot of that web traffic is progressive HTTP download and other web video protocols. Which all brings us to today. When we look at applications today, the rough breakdown is at peak. Netflix, 25 to 30. Lots and lots of CDN, small little CDN, not, uh, not long form video, but uh, objects and, and caching, another 18. 
Uh, YouTube remains a very large portion of backbone traffic at 16 to 20 percent. P2P is down. P2P, of course, used to be 40 percent of backbone traffic back in you know, 2007. It's now still a healthy 12 percent, but of course, dramatically smaller player proportionally than it once was. And you have the uh, other protocols, uh, other over-the-top video, uh, other web traffic, Facebook, Google, and, and others towards the end. So kind of a quick snapshot of what the traffic looks like across several million uh, subscribers across North America over the last, I think this, I did this last week. Uh, you know, one of the real pain points with Netflix is Netflix at peak, where most of the carriers incur their cost is at that 95th percentile and engineering the backbone for that peak cost. However, uh, I think looking at from a uh, uh, subscriber sort of uh, ex quality of experience, happiness, uh, it's interesting to look at average, not just at peak. And if you look at average, actually YouTube is, continues to be the largest dominant average source of over-the-top video with Netflix second, uh, adult video with thousands of websites uh, represented in that category. And then it's a really, really heavy tail distribution across thousands, you know, a couple, it goes out for a hundred uh, websites, each with a small fraction of the streaming video traffic. I should mention that this is an all internet traffic. This is particularly interested in looking at the percentage of over the top uh, streaming video uh, traffic. We're not looking at direct download, not looking at P2P in the slide, not looking at, you know, general web traffic. Just looking at over the top video which, of course, has different sorts of engineering, uh, places different sorts of engineering constraints on the network than uh, other protocols. Just to finish off quickly, I think just to emphasize the point earlier, the painful thing about Netflix, and this is looking at, I think, a Florida city, uh, you know, southeast Florida, uh, mar or Florida market. At the top, you're looking at the diurnal a given day. I think this is April 22nd. You're looking at the traffic. Uh, the bottom graph is showing the number of subscribers. And again, the important thing from this slide is just seeing the peaks. When the peaks occur, they're, they're very peak, and the traffic otherwise drops down considerably in the troughs uh, during the rest of the day, which is somewhat different from YouTube. YouTube also has big peaks, but the troughs aren't quite as, I guess, troughy. Uh, so Netflix, 1 to 6 uh, percent of active subscribers, uh, but using 15 to 25 percent of bandwidth. Really now the major cost driver for carriers. Again, they have to engineer for that peak. If they're doing transit, the 90th percentile, and particularly you know, the directionality of the traffic, all really plays a dominant role in some of the, uh, the cost structure. But that's uh, the last slide. I went through this quickly since I wanted to leave time for questions and our uh, other panelists. But uh, I guess I have time for just one or two questions. It's a very quiet audience. Okay, well, I'll, I'll be around later unless uh, anyone has questions. Going once? Nope? Okay, well, thank you. I was, uh, talk to me privately. <laughs> yeah. Good question, though. Okay, I'll, I'll turn it over. Do you guys? Uh, you had one question there. Go ahead. I was going to ask uh, the Netflix raised such a problem there. How do you see that as an impact on your the question is, uh, with Netflix such an issue, how is it impacting uh, discussions around peering? Uh, you know, I, I think there's been uh, some very public uh, disputes that have made, in fact, the cover of the Wall Street Journal. So, so clearly, uh, I, I think that there's lots of interesting discussions around this. Uh, I think it's not just Netflix, but more broadly, I think the peering ecosystem is changing, or you know, the, the transit, or the uh, you know, it used to be the transit providers held all the power, and then it was just you know, uh, the content held the power. Now you're really seeing a balance being reached between uh, the transit, the content, and the consumer or the eyeball networks. So I think it's a rapidly evolving uh, ecosystem, all of course generally covered uh, under NDA and behind closed doors, so it's, it's difficult to talk about. Okay.